folks, welcome to the Jake Feinberg Show, and we're here at Serafina's uh, Italian restaurant here in Midtown New York with two dear friends that go way, way back in time, both musically, spiritually, they grew up in Queens together, and uh, a couple of decorated studio musicians, Alan Schwartzberg, Bob Mann, welcome to the Jake Feinberg Show. It's an honor, and uh, keep the comments coming in. We've already got people joining, and uh, a lot of people excited here to, to see these two venerable cats. You know, Bob, I wanted to ask you, I had an opportunity in the last uh, two weeks to interview Buzzy Feeton. Now, mm. Buzzy talked about this idea of saying it's important to like the sound that's coming out of your instrument before you develop chops, before technique, that you want to develop, you want to like the sound that you're hearing. How did you develop the sound on your instrument so so that you enjoyed hearing it before you became so technically driven, if you ever did become technically mm -hmm. driven? Interesting. Uh, when I first started playing guitar, it was it was the early kind of you know rockabilly kind of stuff. It was Elvis and it was uh, the Big Bopper and all that kind of stuff that you're trying to you're trying to imitate those sounds. Uh, it was easy to buy the guitar. <laughs> yeah, that, that telly, and then uh, you know you try to find an amp that would make the sound, and you just kind of work on it and uh, changing strings, changing picks, still all the kind of technical stuff that uh, you know the, sax, the guitar version of saxophone mouthpieces until you're getting a sound that you that you don't want to you don't immediately want to throw up as soon as you. Do you the was there an early, was there a time early on when you? We're struggling with that. I guess what I'm trying to get at is that, like, there's a propensity now for cats to just be playing this plethora of notes, notes and notes and notes, and yet they may not necessarily love what they're hearing coming. And so, so I mean, if there was a if there was a memory or a story where you said, "Hey, I kind of like that," because when Buzz said that to me, it kind of it kind of piqued my interest. Well, that's interesting because when I first heard Buzz, that was one of the sounds that I wanted to get. Buzz, you hear? Buzz, he'll be tuning in on this, dude. Oh, he's, a, he's an obsessive Jake great. Feinberg. Yeah. And I actually remember one of the first of only a few sessions I did with Buzz and a few that I did with David, where it was the three of us. I think it was Sanborn. Those, so you're talking about Sanborn? No, David, no, David uh, Spinoza. Spinoza. And uh, I think it was. I I think it might have been a white elephant session. I was going to ask you about, but Maine Airy was very involved with those white elephants. Of course. So, his band. so talk about that feeling. Well, like, how well, did, was it just like, a, I would love the visceral feeling that you had when you were like, wow, I'm really happy with that sound that's emanating from my axe. From mine. You know, it was, it was usually a matter of luck because you, you'd go into a studio and most of the amps were just half or half of your sound as a guitarist were, were beaten up, overused, broken, uh, whatever. And you just couldn't, no matter what you were hearing in your head, you could not make your guitar sound the way you wanted it to sound. Wow. Uh, occasionally you get a, a good amp. And wow, you know, you'd be able to do it. And yeah, that's sitting in there really nice. So that's true. And once that, once that happens, you try to, try to do it again. You know, it's like any good thing. Try to do it again, find out why it was working. Uh, and so much has to do with listening to your, your idols, you know, the people who, you know, I remember early on being really, really listening to the West Coast guitarists. You know? Mund Mundell? Well, no, I'm even talking about further. You know, in jazz, it was, it, it was, it was always West for me. West. West. Uh, those yeah, well, yeah. Sound. Yeah, that's, that's a good and, choice there. You know, those are the two guys that I try to sound like. Did did you did you get to a point where it was like well I, I I can comp some of this stuff the best I can but owning your own individual flavor I mean how all I'm saying is you didn't have the technology that we have today and I'm just I want you to speak to peeps about how to how you created your own individual little flavor off of your idols I never I don't know if I ever thought about creating <laughs> I always wanted to create something that I loved right which was usually something that I had heard. You know, I wasn't searching for an individual sound. Could you give an example? Sound. You give an example? Uh, I listened to Larry Carlton's work on, you know, the old Joni Mitchell stuff. The Ma LA Express stuff. That, to me, nobody was making a sound like that in New York. And, I dig. But it, but I dig it was, that. It was, it was, it was saxophony. Robin Ford was like that. You know, and I wanted to, I wanted to somehow 
make that sound, you know, and uh, you you buy you buy some equipment to do that. <laughs> you buy this, you sell it, you buy something else. Oh, that's getting closer. You know, you string your guitar with different different gauge strings, and it's all about that. And you find something that uh, you know. I I never ever got to the point. Of, ooh, that's my sound. Ooh, right. Yeah, it's, it's ooh, that's a good sound. That's but you, good. but 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 I mean, I, I when I talked, you know, like Alan, I'll, I'll pivot over to you. When I talked to Garibaldi, Garibaldi, uh, Dave, dear friend of mine, definitely will be tuning in on this. I mean, when he was playing in Oakland, if somebody came up and said, "Hey, you sounded just like this guy," he'd want to slit his wrists. It, the onus was on individuality, and I just wanted you to talk about your how you crafted your own individual sound on the drum kit. Because to oh, me, are you, talking to me uh, you were on, baby, live, and people are loving this. Before by the way, keep the comments coming in. People are loving this stuff. Before anything, yeah. Tell me, do I have any green stuff? <laughs> <laughs> no, you're good, man. You no, you look great. Okay. A lot of people are enjoying this. Yeah. Uh, and of course, I forgot the question. The question is just uh, is about individual. Today, it's hard to pick out when you're listening to a horn player or a guitar player. You're having, you're like, who? I, I don't know who it is. Back in the day, you could pick them out in a heartbeat. Right, right. So I, I just want you to riff, riff on the idea of individual sound, how you cultivated it on the on the trap set. You know, drummers notoriously just follow deeply the, their their idols. Like you know, in a split second, whether a drummer loved Elvin. Act, that's very obvious. He's playing all kinds of triplet legs and stuff like that. Uh, I must admit that imitating Tony Williams, Philly Joe Jones, and Elvis, who the, and Roy Hayes, my absolute favorites, gave me a thrill, and absolutely gave me a thrill when I when I would say to myself, if they, especially after hearing it back on a, on a recording, it sounded a little Elvin-y. You know, <laughs> that's what gave me that gave me pleasure. I love, I love it. I'm making no bones about it. Every once in a while, I come up with a little, like, uh, an R&B thing, like a nasty little, uh, little complicated little kind of thing, and uh, and I and I say, hey, that was pretty cool. But I loved, I loved imitating the my heroes, and if it sounded something like it, mission mission accomplished, you know, and I had no bones about it. Bob, you yeah. know, what's interesting is that uh, when I talked to Trope, for instance, uh, he, what, what surprised me, you know, Abercrombie said it to me too, he said, you know, back in the day, if you wanted to get gigs, you had to have, you had to have good rhythm. And a lot of people think, a lot of guitar players think they have good rhythm, but they don't. And I wanted to ask you, were you, Trope said, as we continue to get more people <laughs> joining, this is going to be a monstrous situation here. Uh, as we, Trope was actually motivated, he learned rhythm from the B3 cats that he played with, from the organ, is, is it something along, I mean, did you learn rhythm from guitarists or did you learn it from other other instruments? God, I think, well, when it came to r and I have to, look, I, I was a little late to, to the party because I was, as I told you just before we started uh, being on the show, I spent four years uh, not being in, in Vietnam, but by joining the Air Force, Air Force band, that's right. being in DC and playing and you know, big band type music and arranging for big bands and whatever. When I came back, Alan, my good buddy here, said, Bob, you gotta listen to the meters. Mm. Mm. He said, if there's anything you're gonna like. George Porter Jr.'s tuning in. I know he's listening right now, man. No, and Zig, what was, specifically, Alan, what was it, because people have been saying this about the meters. What was it about their, Abel Boreal said it too. The meters were intoxicating in that time. It's somehow it, it's very much like the the missing link between jazz jazz and um, and R&B, like dan- right, and R&B, dancing, yeah. yeah it was like rock the Lucy the Lucy uh, what is it the the the, uh, the, the old uh, the ape that when they found Lucy they, you know, this was King the, Kong oh yeah yeah, yeah. It, the mummy yeah. the mummy Lucy and this was the the turning point with, with humanity. <laughs> Uh, and it was the meters, man. That was, and then 
and James Brown too, but Meters had it snakier, right, Bob? It was like right, it was snakey and it was unpredictable. Right. You know, I mean, even if they played the same thing for three minutes before they changed, right. like James Brown, there was a certain unpredictability about what it was that they were playing and how, I don't know, how how it popped out of their instruments, you know, and that, that to me kind of gave me a link between what I loved in jazz and what I was going to end up loving in, in pop music. You know, so I was able to like grab that ladder, start listening to that stuff, and, and develop a passion for it. Which you know, which... were you, were you in any organ trios at all, or any, any court? Because that, that that was the hot I, ticket back in the Benson. Never, those I was never in any for a long time. But when I was in D.C., yeah. I got a chance to play with Gene Smith. Ooh. And, in D.C. Well, he, and after he, hours. We, no, a lot of people say he was the first bebop organist. Tell, tell me about playing with Jimmy. It was it was a totally physical experience. I mean, as soon as that as soon as that medium like up medium tempo started, <laughs> first of all, it was louder than almost anything because because Mountain hadn't arrived yet. Well, we're gonna, and people are already commenting in Twin Peaks. Yeah. People are fired yeah. up about Twin Peaks. Yeah, yeah. it was so loud and it just. His rhythm carried you along. He was so swinging. The bass was just so big. You, you had your amp way into distortion. Zone, I dig. Which you didn't really want to do, but that, and you couldn't. Sit, you really couldn't fall out of that group. Was he it kicking was, pedals? It was a duo. Yeah, yeah. And it was just a duo. It was well. It was a trio. It was a guitar trio. Uh, but but a guitar, B three and drums. And drums. Yeah. No, and he was playing oh, yeah. bass lines. Yeah, he was playing bass lines. Schwartzberg, I, I love. Th we're having a ball here. Keep the comments coming in. People are loving this worldwide. Uh, I, I'm obsessed with the idea. You talk about Elvin, Philly Joe, but going back to Kenny Clark and uh, and Max. Okay, a lot of these cats. It just, you know, I'm not a musician, really. I'm not a professional musician. But the idea is that how did they use the cymbals to keep time and use the bass drum as an accent? Because in today's musical lexicon, you listen very strongly to rock music, double bass drums pulsating. As George Marsh would say, it sounded like a machine gun, okay? Those cats were keeping time on the cymbals. Can you, can you talk about the ability to not, to, to not use the bass drum as the primary timekeeper, or how those cats use the cymbals to keep time and use the bass drum for rebound? You know, I'm not... Great on, on uh, you can push back on that history stuff, yeah. You know, but I know that Kenny Clark was a huge influence on uh, and Max on Philly Joe, very big. Huge. Why? I mean, I just hear it in the licks, I yeah, mean, right, right, right. The exact same licks with different tuned drums and stuff, but it's the exact same stuff. Uh, what else? Uh, when you started playing the drums, were you were you were you, were you using the cymbals to keep time? I mean, I I, I this, the cymbal Joe Sample, rest in peace, and Reggie Workman both say they could go see a jazz set, and nobody's cats aren't using the cymbals anymore, not for colors. I just want you to know how you, how do you how you use the cymbals. Well, I, I just want that because yeah. I, I had a senior moment. Just now. <laughs> <laughs> but the bass drum was often used as. A do -do 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 you know, they would, but it, it sounds crazy to me because you would do that if there was no bass player, you know. But if, if the bass player is walking, there's no need to have the bass drum going in that phase. Although I think, well, isn't that what bebop, isn't that started bebop? I yeah, mean, if, before yeah. bebop, drummers were playing four. Yeah, four on the floor, definitely four on the floor. Yeah. Yeah. But and with an occasional boom, you know, with yeah. an occasional right. kick and stuff like that. Which, which accentuated it, the whole thing. Then it became... Just kicks. Yeah, because you know? the bass players was, yeah, the bass players were walking, walking the floor. That's the point that uh, I just wanted to make. And what's the, the second half of the question? <laughs> What's in your teeth, Al? No, no, you know what it is? It's, it, it's, I just want you to know, how, I would like you to talk to peeps all over the world about how to use the symbols to, to, for time and color. Because the, all I'm saying is, work, Reggie Workman said you can go see a 45-minute jazz set mm -hmm. and the drummers don't touch the cymbals the entire set. Yeah, he said that, huh? Um, how did you use the cymbals? How did you use the cymbals? Too much, with, yeah, too much. I think. I think. No, I don't think. So, yeah. I think where you work is point is great. I love. I love when you come off the cymbals and, and you're playing. You're playing the whole instrument. It's not just some drummers. I mean, there's like 
like a guy like Connie K. That's it. Just, just play ding, 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 ding. I didn't hear anything else going on. I didn't hear any other goosing or nudging or anything like that. Not, no disrespect. I mean, he sounded great with MGK. But, uh, you know, I think, uh, I think that says it. You know, I, I, when when you were when you were at the half note still scrounging around with Cameron and, and Tabak and yeah. were you like were you all over the kit were you, you how how did you learn to use the whole kit I was trying to play out and out I'm trying to play like Elvin you were just trying to play like Elvin I was trying to imitate Elvin can you can you do a, a drum pattern on the table but about Elvin can you can you can you do a pattern an Elvin pattern no I didn't no, he was doing a really good job. You know, Bob, I, this is why we have this, these guys go back to Queens from the 50s. I mean, this is, these guys are deep. No, no, when we were growing up, I, I grew up with three drummers and myself. Three drummers? Schaefer? Schaefer? Steve Schaefer and Alex. Who was the other cat? Steve Schaefer. And Marty? And Marty Morell. Marty Morell. Marty Morell. Oh, my. Burning. Yeah, dude, burning. Yeah, no, he was doing all that great, stuff with the Canadian cat. Dude, that. Oh, yeah. Ridiculous. Yeah, yeah Bill Evans, but, man. But Alan was, very, the guy, very close. Very close. Alan was the guy with the Elvin secrets that everybody. That, that yeah, I turned, I turned Marty Morell on to sure. some drummers that he never never heard of these guys. And I turned them on to when we were kids. We were all going to Manhattan School of Music together. And what did, what did that? I, I was going to ask Bob. I mean, you were going to nothing. I was going to. Well, no, because because I, I do okay. Just kind of a yes or no question, and then you can riff on this. People continue the comments coming, and this is going to be. This is working out fantastic with Bob Mann and Alan Schwartzberg. Can the vocabulary of musics grow in academia? Ooh, it didn't. It didn't for me. Uh, but back I then, but, 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 you, okay, go ahead. I, I mean, came in, I came into school as a a musician who knew what he wanted to do, which was what play. I wanted to play jazz and whatever else I needed to do. Make a living. To make a living. Sure. I went to Manhattan School of Music to to stay out of the war, for one thing, to make my parents happy, and to meet other musicians. Certainly not to become a music teacher, which was really about the only thing that you could end up doing with that degree at that time. Yes. Uh, they didn't allow you to play jazz in the practice There was no rooms. Berkeley. There was no Berkeley. It was nothing like it. Okay, so, it, the, 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 but my, but, okay, so I guess what I, um, the better question is that in today's world, you're going to, you're, you're going to these chop shops. Oh, Don, yeah. Don Menza would say it's like an assembly line where you're cranking out these guys with huge chops. They have nowhere to play. So it was kind of like. Everybody can play now. Who graduates in music. They can, play, they can play, but they, can they feel? Can, can they feel it? That's, that's. That's, that's a good question, question Jay. Yeah, well, question. I appreciate you telling me. That's that's my job. I mean, I, there's no right or wrong answers here. It's just again, that's these right. guys are and from a. No right or wrong answer to that it's because feel is who's who's determining whether. Can you talk about Bob? How, I mean, you you did you were surrounded by drummers, but they were playing feel music. So you could you talk about how you learned to feel music in general? Because today, I'm not sure if people are even aware. I mean, my daughters, for instance, they've had digital beats crunched into their ears for two decades so they don't even really know that what human music might sound like. Can you talk about how you learned to feel music? Boy, it's, well, what I can talk about is how, how differently the time feel was. Go ahead, from, I, from please one, talk about from that. one player to another. Right. You know, certain players, and you know, I don't think I'll, I'll use names because a lot of people that I worked with, I, I would say that everyone had a different approach to where the where the beat is, where the beat was, the center of the beat, the back part of the beat, the front part of the beat. And you know, you, you become kind of astute at listening to that because so much of how you played and what you played depended on what was being laid down in that way. Because it was real human beings, so they had human different beings. time feel. Constant adjustment and constant like, ooh. Okay, so we're going this place. <laughs> Let's be in this place. And it, it was always a puzzle to, in a, in a way, to figure out who was lead. I mean, it, it was a fluid situation in terms of who was leading and who was following. And uh, sometimes it would be a lick from our lovely, great old friend Jerry Friedman, that, who had perfect, perfect, wonderful time, and he and a way of just playing some little something that would make everybody else. Oh, I got this thing. Oh, I got this thing, and it's like bang. Right. 
they, here's a track with a, a bunch of great things, all inspired by one little something that, that was just being played right. with heart and and feeling. One of my favorite. Keep projecting out, guys, because yeah. people people are saying they want to hear. They can't hear you. Keep going. One of my absolute favorite expressions okay. is, "Can you tap your foot to it?" Right. Not even literal. I mean, literally. Can you can you dance to it? Of course. So you understand that. But even mentally, can you tap your foot to that? Which, which means, does it resonate with you? Do you get it? Does it I picture when, when the music is happening beautifully and the time feel is happening, I picture dancers. Right. And I see dancers, you know? You see shag dancing contests where the legs are like rubber and they're like moving around. It's like ding 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 Yeah. Get a waiter. And we're, we're here in the restaurant in real time. <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> no, you, you said you know you said something to me. The early Miles records, swing records, you could do the Lindy to it. The Lindy. Okay, so it was dance music. It was danceable music. Danceable, right? And so that's about a, that's a kind that's that's feel. But your brain can tap to it. Then he got into then he got into the deep deeper stuff. And that, but you, you could tap your brain to it, but sure. you, you, you didn't necessarily get up and go bob your head or or, sh or move your shoulders or anything. But it it was like that. Except well, it was yeah. I mean, it was it was from feet to your head. Yeah, I remember so many times being in clubs, and when it was when it was just burning, right, right. my head I couldn't stop doing it. I was oh. tapping my head like Bill Evans. Like yeah. Bill Evans. Bill Evans is not dance music or anything, but you're, you're, you're like this, you're like this, and you and then you sometimes you cry, you, know, you can cry from it. You know, I mean, to talking to Alan Schwartzberg and Bob Man live here on Facebook. I, you know, uh, Mayneri's going to be tuning in at some point on this interview, and I wanted Bob. He told a story about Donald McDonald and him uh, and uh, Hugh McCracken uh, looping. They were doing a lot of looping, and then Jeremy Steig was doing film projection. Okay, this is back in like '65. Can you talk about the most experimental? Uh, music that you did early on, even maybe before your career, but the idea of music concrete, incorporating electronic, any kind of electronic music, d experimenting, and, and, and that kind of stuff, because that stuff was very fertile at that time. Are you talking to me? Uh, <laughs> Robert I, I, <laughs> what I'm saying is that, that, I, he, that it was. He, what I'm getting, maybe it wasn't exactly that template, okay, with yeah. what, what, what Donald was doing. But they, they would, they would, they would find these licks. They would hear the tapes back. They'd say, "I like this." They're going to loop it. Jeremy's doing. Uh, so it's multi. It's multi art. Uh, no, multi. Yeah, multi yeah, art. Yeah. I mean, a little bit. I, dreams. Okay, was, and yeah. Dreams and dreams. We would do. We would. We would tape jams. Right. We would. We would blow. We would tape jams, and oftentimes. The, you know, the, the germ of a of, of a song would come from uh, something that we heard and said, "Ooh, okay, let's let's develop that. Or let's play that some more, and you know, do that." I mean, in terms of my own personal, where what the kind of musician that I am, or the kind of person that I am, I'm I'm not looking for something that's way out on the edges of anything. I'm looking for meat. And it's in the middle, and it's 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 just something. It's it's what I I respond to. I think I came up listening to lots of lots of just good music, the good kind, you know, whatever it was. And that's that's really all we did in terms of experimenting. I did play on a couple of films where the composer would basically say, okay, for the next four minutes, just watch this. Play whatever you want, mm. and sometimes it was great. Which fun. films were those? I want because no, nothing big. No, nothing but I, 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 I want to add it to the discography. You don't remember? Oh god, no, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, you don't guys, remember. For the perspective, you guys were living in New York during the Warhol years. There was a lot of wild experimentation going on. There was a lot of psychedelics going on. But the, the, you know, you, 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 here's the point: Garibaldi used to sit in his apartment in Oakland with the guy named Harvey Hughes, and they used to just all, sit all day and trade drumlet and just play, play these. They work out these. Fierce grooves, man. And I'm just wondering if you guys going grooves. Key word there. Mm, key word. Did you guys do that growing up in Queens? I mean, did you work, play games? I mean, we did. We did. I, I think Bob, you didn't do it as, maybe as much as I did because I was 
playing with Donnie Kretmar and, and yeah, stuff like that. But the free jazz thing. Yeah. Man, you know, I really, I, I did it, and it, it kind of, you'd have to have a couple of beers to, that, that helps. And you play anything. You just play anything. And it's going to be okay, because you're not going to get fired, you know? But, man, I think that amounts to shit. Uh, really. I don't think it amounts to anything. Really? Yeah. I, 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 I'm going to just go out on a limb and just say I, I hated it. You know, I really hated it. You're talking about like, like when I, Ornette it, came out with the harm a lot? I mean, no, no, no. No, Ornette was, was not. Ornette was beautiful. Yeah. So what do you, what, when you say free? I'm talking about no time. You know, time, I don't want to. Yeah, right. I think Barry Altschul is a drummer that used to play in a lot of those. Where I think Rashid Ali was one of those drummers where they, they were. We don't need, to, it's like, we don't need no stinking grooves, you know? It's like, uh, just going to do cymbal rolls and blah, blah, blah. Right. Be with the gold band. And, <laughs> and finally... <laughs> okay, but, 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 but let me, uh, Bob, let me, let me ask you about your concept of the idea. Like in Dreams, uh, the second album was Muscle Shoals. That was Cropper and, right. and I mean, that's my favorite album of all time. <laughs> Brecker and just ridiculous music on there and I did I thought Schwartzberg actually was on that record but he's not but um, can you talk about your concept of the idea of any note can be the one any note can be that, the, the idea that it, when people are fo- focused on where's the one where's the one where's the one and the idea is that you get lost in some sort of improvisational instrumental jam where's and the, the idea one? that okay. as a group any note can be the one. People are fixated now. The rhythm sections. Where's the one? Where's the one? Where's the one? And James Jamerson used to say, "Any note can be the one." And I just want your. Are we talking about the one in terms of beats? That's a bit, beats. Yeah, that, because what he was just saying is kind of. Mm. And, and, it does relate to that. It does relate, but I just. But to me, a lot of cats feel liberated when uh, they learn that any note can be the one. But you, I, mean, I don't know. I, I don't, mean, don't understand that. Oh, I, I, well, I, I, I know what Jake is saying. I'm, I'm, I'm tell tell the, him now. I'm not the guy. I know, what, I know what he's saying. <clears throat> it's. Uh, where the expression where's one where's one where's one where's one I mean uh, yeah. George, where's, George where's Young the saxophone player was hung over one morning he came over to our table we, we, we finished a jingle and had breakfast and he staggered over <laughs> and he said where's one guys <laughs> you know? I mean that's what it means yeah. you know what he's getting at Pop I mean, uh, uh, of course of course you, you go ahead but that's, so that's any, not note can, any note could be the one is what I was saying sucks okay it's that's mm-hmm. what I was hearing from you. Yeah, that's, that's what, you, what I was, you heard. Where's Juan? Yeah. Someone just commented, where's Juan? Yeah. Even Elvin, when Elvin is soloing through, he asked, you could ask Chip Jackson. Uh, we played with him a long time. Great bass player. Is he still around? Chip, yeah, he's, he's great, great player. He played with Elvin so much, and he said he was never, even though he was going, all kinds of cool shit. He was there. The one was there all the time. You just had to. You had to keep it. You had to keep. And he challenged, and he said it was a challenge. But Elvin was always there. It never was just a free solo. It was not just I'm going to play anything and then I'm going to give you a ba ba da 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 ba. Right. Exactly. Okay. So let me, Bob. Let me ask you this. Okay. So so, but the the when I talk to Brecker, you know, he's talking about. Uh, the Miles rhythm section of Tony, uh, Ron and Tony breaking up time and breaking up form. Breaking up time and breaking can you, up can form. Can you just riff on that? And Because <laughs> they started to like, uh, uh, God, Alan had a great standard the other day and I can't remember what he said it was. Uh, but like My Funny Valentine. And then they go off. But then they collectively come back in. Sure. That was a cathartic experience for a lot oh, of peeps. Oh, yeah. Can you talk about Can you talk about it? Well, I mean, I, to me it's not... The structure is is primary, and then if you, if if suddenly improvisationally somebody decided that uh, three quarters of the way through the song there's a little there's a there's an exit into what could be a a rap a rhapsodic ten minutes. There you go. That's fantastic. Yeah. You haven't you you know what what you've done is you've altered the form. You haven't really altered the form. You've altered. You've altered the concept of time in a way to say, okay, I'm going away from here for a minute. Right. I'm going to come we'll back though because without coming back, there's no the, there's no tension. 
If I, okay, so here's my point about the one, is that everybody trusts each other and leaves together, and then they have to come back. Yeah. That, to me, is the magic of music. Yeah, okay? That's a it. Great right. it's a great moment. Right. Everybody in the audience, even the women, even the women, the housewives. Yeah. Yeah, I swear they know it. They, they know, know it. They, they know it, man. And that's when it, it becomes good. like, yeah, that's when they find people get up and spontaneously start like, whoa. Yeah, because and they react they, and they applaud. They actually applaud. This is why I, this is why I love talk because I mean you know that that's the spiritual, that's a transcendent. That's really what more what I meant. That's, Not free with no time or anything like that. It's the idea of breaking it up and then all coming collectively yes. back in together. And that's also when you feel the closest. You feel no separation between yourself and the other people who are performing. <sighs> yeah, because so something just happened that was shared in a way that was, as you say, without words and without instructions and without preconceptions. And wow, that's that's what it's all about. Would that happen in dreams? Yeah, it would. I would be part of it sometimes, and a lot of times I wouldn't be part of it. But it would be it would happen on stage. Yes, and, and I mean, so we would. And it was more like hearing somebody, you were talking about this off air, where you'd hear somebody play and it would take you. Your ears were huge. Do you, Bob, is there, was there a formative time? I mean, because you were, we talked a little bit about being with some of these pop, more pop acts, but was there a time when you could talk about when your ears grew the most? I think I was really fortunate that my dad was a musician and I got great music great. What, was, what, what did he play what was he, he was classical a, music he was a piano no pianist he was a he was a pop guy he was like Dick Hyman guy oh no, oh. matter of fact Dick my father was one of Dick, Dick's favorite Dick, guys Dick Hyman they did man. records Counterpoint together Counterpoint for Six Vows man they did records together for the uh, what was that label out on Long Island where they have like oh. Oregon Holiday and my, it would be my dad and, and I want to get this and, lick in real really quick go ahead Adam. that uh, Hank Jones one of Hank Jones' favorite piano players oh, yeah. was Bob Spot. Yeah, Simon. Simon. He was he was on staff when there were big Simon. staff. Simon. Simon. Big yeah. staff at CBS and NBC. Of, I found a lot of yeah. Wikipedia things, but and he worked with Streisand. Everybody and a bunch knew. Of people everybody and, knew. Know, was he a bebop? Did he play bebop? He played he enough played bebop to sub for Teddy Wilson occasionally ah. in. Uh, Dude, I love in, some of that that Gypsy Jack, the Gypsy Goodman's band. Oh my yeah. god, I love Teddy, Teddy Wilson. Wow. Yeah. Is that beer still there? Can you pass that? Yeah. But I was lucky but enough to be to, Hank you know, Jones, one of Hank Jones' favorite players. Boy, I just I just hung out with him when I was really young, and he would he he gave me like ear training, and that was fun. But on the bandstand, uh, like when you like sonically, I mean, it, to me, the digital, the compression of music, the di the drum machine. I, I mean, that was the point. Uh, someone said to me before when. Uh, when the drum machine came out, all of a sudden human beings started to try to emulate a machine, mm. and that took away from individuality. We just lost Mickey Roker. You knew you could tell Mickey Roker right away Absolutely. as a drummer. Okay, great, Tony Williams, great, great Pete player. LaRocca. All these Pete cats LaRocca. had serious. Joe Chambers will be watching this right. interview. All these mm. cats had their own individual sound. Great, but so I just keep going back to that because I, I fundamentally believe that if you go if you in music as in life, if things become too formulaic. That's how ultimately you become. I don't want to get too extreme, but that's what uh, this is how Hitler's come about. Okay, <laughs> you know, and and, and, and and we're not that no, far you're, away you're from. We're not that far. Okay, yeah, so what yeah. I'm saying is that if Very you have, apropos. you know, if you, it, you know, so uh, Bob, if you just fundamentally, when you could you just talk a little bit about when you look back on your career, how you found your own voice and whether. It was through adversity that you found it. Whether you just got, you just said, you know, I'm just going to be Bob Man. You know, I just never thought about it. Right, these are the Jake Farmer shows. Ask me. And I always, I always, I always kind of scratch my head. In fact, yeah. When I used to listen, when I used to read interviews and downbeat or whatever about somebody asking the question, well, how can I find my own voice? How can I be individualistic? How can I, you know, how am I going to be myself? Right. I wasn't interested. I, I believed that as I long as I was playing say music, that you, you, you're going to be David Spinoza. <laughs> <laughs> no, but that wasn't me for musical reasons. I know. I'm going to go to that. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> this, there might be kids watching. <laughs> right. Um, sorry. <laughs> Hi, David. But um, no, I love no, it. but it wasn't. It, that wasn't part of my quest. Right. And right. If, and if somebody could recognize me. 
it was basically because I was I just played the things that I liked and 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 they could recognize that. And I I really don't think a lot of the greatest musicians searched for their identity. Although some did, I know. I know. I'm sure I'm sure John Coltrane went through his you know, and a lot of people like that. I wasn't one of those kind of people, obviously. You know, and Sonny Rollins practiced and uh, to that point, Sonny Rollins practiced uh, in fact Bob Cranshaw told me since when Sonny Rollins' wife died, he went down from tw practicing 12 hours a day to 8 hours a day. Only 8? Yeah, only 8. Only 8. Only eight, eight hours a day. Yeah. I mean, he was, you don't get much greater than Sonny right. Rollins, but he's, he's after what he's, he's after that, that sexual player in his dreams. That he hears, that he's trying to make come out in this on this plane. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's what we do. We just try to right, we try to play the things that we love to hear from you know from either other people, whatever, or music. Let me ask you both. You can both chime in on this, but uh, why why did you decide to end Deep Diner Records? Well, and speci specifically the climate of the studio, being that they're... I just deep want to, Diner Studios. Yeah, Deep, deep Diner, diner Studios. studios. We We're doing a deep dive at a deep diner, but ultimately the conditions that are current as to why you decided it's not worth it. Hmm. Excellent question. Excellent question. Business. It was really business, right? Yeah. Meaning there's not enough... Jake, you must know that everybody, everybody watching this thing has a studio in their house. Okay? Right. So, you know, the old joke about I could phone it in, you know, I phoned it in. <laughs> you are phoning it in now, and everybody is. Uh, people have set, you know, drum setups in their house, and they do track. They're sent the uh, Pro Tools file. You put it up, lay it up, and you play your drum part to it, send it back, and send it back, and there it is. So there's no, there's no real need for a studio. Clients, clients are getting emailed uh, if you have jingles. You, you write a jingle, you send it off. They don't, they don't have to be in the studio anymore. They don't, well, okay, but, no but, here, but here's the thing. If you, you guys were not charging exorbitant prices, okay, what is the, why is it, is there still incentive to maybe pay a little bit more to have human beings in the room together? I know it's not, it's not in vogue, but I'm saying the magic of Nobody money. cares, Jake, it's money. It, it's a big part of it, man. It's a big part of it. So it you has to be have, sold on a mass level. Yeah, I mean, also there is a lot. There are libraries of music. Now. These, there, there are music houses that right back. The, yeah, oh, the, you can get any kind of music. You can get you, any. I need, want it to be purpose. sad for sixty <laughs> seconds, and then I want it to, yeah. to be like absolute like Detroit hip hop for ten seconds. And okay, I got that. I got that. I got that piece. And you just glue them together, and, and there's your score. And the, sound design is a huge thing. Sound that, design, you know, that, that there are right. I mean, and, and it's wonderful. And people whose heads are into it can can kind of mix music and and sound design to to a point where it, it's it's a it's kind of an art. It's really an it art, is, and absolutely. it's something. But it's not speaking to our musical needs, really. Can you talk about the because this, this is the this is the crux of it? Is that and one reason I I wanted to talk to you guys is that. If there are peeps out there, because jazz is now a world music more than ever, sure. okay? And if there are cats out there who are looking to unplug, or they can't pay their cable bill, and they don't watch YouTube, okay? And they just want to be raw, and, exp and, and just the way you guys were in Queens, with Schaefer, the drummers, what would be your advice to them insofar as trying to create improvisational, instrumental music? Unplug, just give, you know, even if it inspires one cat in this world, well, you can both take this on, but the idea is that you it's know, a great closing question. We're not ready to end yet. <laughs> <laughs> I we're not ready. To, I, 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 I can't possibly. Oh, it's, no, it's, a, it's a, no. We're just we're just okay. you know, we're, we're right. barely at halftime yet. Okay. No, no, I'm kidding. Yeah. Okay. okay. Hmm. Gone, but did you want to answer? I, I, I forget the question already. If thank you when you when, when you when you when you told me to when, no, when you told me before you said you said I wasn't even interested in a career in music because I was playing music. Yeah. Okay. Explain that to peeps who are basically saying, I'm, I don't want to make a million bucks. I don't need the money. I just want to play what feels good. 
can you car, can you just drop some tidbits for people? Not in the current. But what what could they do? What should they do? I think what they could do is if they have if if it's in their nature, try to find. Listen to as much different music as is out there, older music and newer music, and find something to like about almost, you know, if you can find something to like about each bit of it, then squeeze your way through that little, you know, that little keyhole and, and open yourself up to that bit. And from that, learn as much as you can about that music so that you... When you get called to play it, if you ever do, you have you have a love for it. You have a, you have an empathy with it, and you know what you, you know what you're doing. Uh, I everything is so different about music and the opportunities today, oh, and the yeah. music that has happened in the last 50 years that's changed. You know, from my experience, that I you know what what I have to say may not be germane to to a lot, but. I think it's for me. It would be that. I, I did. I'd look at it. Al, look at I that. would say. I, I would say. No matter what instrument attracts your fancy, you got to learn keyboard. You should have some keyboard shop. Why? I, because because the whole all of the music is right there. You know, it's like the bass. The bass line could be there. The chords. The, the chords. The, harmo the harmonic structure and stuff like that. It's a. It's a basic music knowledge thing you should have. And in fact, most most players, saxophone players, everybody, Bob plays. Bob plays good piano. You know, he, I play a little, a little bit of uh, imitation Bill Evans piano. You know, but you know, well, bullshitty though. But, uh, but some I can I can play. Some. I love piano. Did you, Did you get and, off on the on the uh, like the the period? Miros, I interviewed Miroslav Vichus, and when he came, when he was talking about. Coming here in '61, hearing LaFaro and Bill communicating in a different way that the bass and the and the piano never did. In fact, LaFaro was having a conversation about that. I mean, do you think it's in isolation, or do you need to be with human beings? So it's what I'm still trying to get at is the idea that you guys were not. You might have been might have been woodshedding once you got done. You were playing for hours together. Schaefer, yeah. you. I mean, give me a break. You know. You got to well. You got to play with people, or else you know you. Why do you need to play with people? You have to interact. It's just like having a conversation with yourself. You have to have. A, it sparks other ideas. It, it opens. It opens you up to hear other stimuli coming coming exterior stimuli. You can't just do everything. You can practice all day long, and, and maybe you'll be. Uh, I don't know who's like a who's a solo guitarist who never appears with anybody. Is there such a thing? Yeah, I'm well, sure there's a lot of guy. Them. No, there, there's, there's only a few guy. left that can really put people in the seats so, solo. Who's the guy that hammered? That did all oh, that? Uh, Stan, uh, Stanley uh, Stanley Jordan, Jordan yeah. was one. Stanley yeah. Jordan. But I mean, there are a lot of you know. I mean, players. That's a novelty kind of thing. And but if you want to play with other people, you got to start playing with other people. You have to you have to practice. Bob, I think what you have yeah. to what you have to get used to is reacting to something at this reacting you know extemporaneously what does because, that do? explain can you unpack that a little bit yeah i mean you can learn a solo at home and you can go and play with a bunch of guys and and no matter what they play you're going to play that solo right, 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 right. and it sounds stupid and dumb right <laughs> exactly <laughs> and it's, it's not doing you or anybody else any good right what's doing what's what's doing the most good is having your instrument under you as best you can and then coming together with people who who also know that the only thing that's going to happen here that's real is is what happens spontaneously exactly wow good one did you uh, can you before we because a lot of people went, tons of comments keep them coming in people are loving this but uh, bob first um, could you talk about the experience how did mountain come about i mean did you who knew <laughs> Papillardi and let and, and actually and I did you did you want to because yeah. right, so, yeah. I mean that I, was, I still can't get my ear around that live album it is <laughs> it is a burning ferocious album but I'm it curious fun. can you take fun. this is part of right. this is part of promoting mm -hmm. I was working with Felix uh, okay. at Electric Lady uh, is that cat still around he was a record no. producer he's long gone reason. yeah long gone his wife his wife shot him. Okay. good okay. Uh, crazy and she was crazy she's probably still there if she's alive uh, but uh, we were working on a project uh, Maggie Bell. Maggie, Maggie Bell, Bell. Maggie Bell. Ma really Bell. good 
And then I've uh, seen that record. Yeah. He's he said, uh, you know, uh, uh, drummer. Who's the drummer? Corky, Corky Corky Lang. Corky Lang wasn't going to make this Japanese uh, Japanese tour. Uh, did I want to do it? And I said, yeah, I think so. And uh, Bob and I play together all the time. And I, I said, what about uh, another guitar player? Because I know Leslie West is great. He's a great rock and roll player. But I know what kind of musician Bob is, and I know. I said, he and also could play some keyboard stuff. He says, yeah, okay. And, uh, and we did.